Awesome. Um, if you're ready to get started, I'm sure more people will come in uh, as you start, but. Yeah, sounds great. All right. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Husky Hacks. Uh, my real name is Matt. Um, and this is a talk uh, about malware analysis and more specifically about malware analysis of the NIM language. Malware and binary analysis, they kind of go hand in hand. Um, so uh, first thing that I want to say, let me get my show notes up here so I'm not just like going off the cuff here. Um, this is, uh, yeah, this is really cool. I, I've, I love doing this kind of stuff and, and to be speaking at uh, DEF CON 615 is just absolutely awesome. So thank you to uh, Digital Bull, uh, also known as Metastable State. Uh, thank you, Corgi, for having me to do this. I am, I, I was really looking forward to this. And when I came up with the idea, it just, it, it, it was like, oh man, I can't wait to, to pull this off. So um, yeah, so, but uh, before we begin, I actually want to start with the invocation. So could we all just bow our heads and, and, uh, and, and say it with me, the invocation to the demo gods. Um, oh, demo gods on high. I uh, come before you as a mortal. Um, this bit would have been much better with the camera, but it doesn't matter. Uh, I offer you a sacrifice of this Amazon Cat5 cable that I found in my closet 10 minutes before I had to come on here. So um, please give me safe passage through this demonstration, and uh, you'll just have to take my word for it that I just snipped it in half with a pair of scissors. Anyway, so hello, my name is Husky Hacks again. Um, what you're going to do for this talk, if you want this to be more of a kind of interactive experience, is you're going to go to this link right here that I'm highlighting, uh, bit.ly dc615-the crown. If you go to that link, you should find my GitHub repository for uh, the crown, which is right here. And this is, there are no slides for this talk. I do not like slides. I am more of a um, kind of tip of the fingers, like, you know, touch kind of craftsperson kind of thing. So I don't like slides. I don't like explaining things and reading off a slide deck. So instead, I'm going to explain things and read off of a Jupyter notebook, which I don't think is much better, but it's there's a little bit more interaction in it. So there are two kind of ways that you can go about uh, experiencing this talk. Um, if you don't want to go through the pain, and I would understand if you just kind of want to watch and, and kind of play along, uh, if you don't want to go through the pain of like setting everything up, you can go and click on main.ipynb. And that's going to bring you right up to the main uh, Jupyter Notebook here. When you click on this uh, through the magic of GitHub, your um, uh, Jupyter Notebook is going to render in the browser. And so this is basically everything that you would see in the real Jupyter Notebook. And if we could just get uh, mute there. Uh, I, I do, when it gets recursive like that, I get, I get absolutely mind flooded, but that's okay. Um, I appreciate it. So uh, you'll see everything in the Jupyter Notebook itself, but you will not see, um, or you will not have the capability to run code in this. So that's like, if you've never seen Jupyter Notebooks before, they've got like Python interpreters inside of them. Um, so it's, uh, it's a cool way to like run code alongside of the kind of documentation. Um, so if you want to just kind of watch and, and check out the notebooks, that's a good way to do that. You just won't be able to run anything. Um, but if you, I'll get out of Party Parrot here, if you want to stand up the actual Jupyter notebook, it's, it becomes a bit more of a, an interactive process. Uh, so you'll go to main.ipynb, uh, interactive Python notebook, and you'll uh, get uh, brought here. And so... That's kind of the the two different ways to experience this. You can either just play along right in the browser or you can download it. I have Dockerized it so it stands up in three commands. It's super, super easy, super straightforward. You can also install it from source and that kind of stuff. Okay, anyway. So with that having been said, uh, when you open up the Jupyter Notebook, I'm going to just do everybody a favor here. And I, I uh, installed as part of the packages and the dependencies uh, the JL Dracula theme. Uh, so we drop that right into dark mode and we get going. Um, all right, so we are going to talk about uh, this language known as NIM and its applications as an offensive language and its um, considerations from a defensive perspective too. Uh, so what does that mean? We're going to talk about the offensive uses of NIM and the malware analysis uh, considerations when you are uh, debugging, decompiling, and analyzing NIM malware. Um, so let's jump right into it. Uh, so for those of you not familiar with Jupyter Notebooks, I give just a little bit of an, a um, kind of rundown of, of what you're actually doing in a Jupyter Notebook. So like I said, if you hit uh, shift and enter on any one of these cells, you will run the cell 
these cells have either markdown in them or they have the Python uh, kernel for interpretation of commands. And so if I go down here and I have written hello DC615 to a variable and then print it out right here, you can see hello DC615. Uh, you can also notice that this is a REPL, a read eval print loop. And so this Python interpreter is like a self-contained in a notebook and it's keeping track of everything that you do. Uh, another kind of example of a REPL would be, it's not one for one, but if you just straight up run Python 3 right here. So like if you like import OS, that is now an imported package inside of this REPL. So this is just in this Python interpreter here. That is now a part of the what, what the Python interpreter is keeping track of. Same exact thing is going on here. So uh, you'll keep track of the cells that you're running by one and two, and you can, you can just keep running each of the cells and they, they start to stack up in a number. Uh, but if you want to restart the kernel, you can double tap the zero command, or the, the zero key rather. So tap, tap uh, on zero and you can hit restart. And that should restart all of the um, the interpretation. If you want to restart and clear all of the cells, you can do uh, restart kernel and clear all outputs. And so when you do that, all of the outputs from under the cells will go away. And then if I try to print hello again, I should get an exception, hello is not defined. So, and then if you wanted to fix that error, you would go run that cell from before and then you run it again and you have hello DC. So just, just a little rundown of how to use a Jupyter Notebook. Um, the the reason this talk is through Jupyter Notebooks is to just make it a little bit more interactive. And so that's just a little rundown of how to actually use it. So this is the the kind of obligatory Who Am I slide, um, and it's huge. Oh my goodness. Uh, so I'm, my name is Matt Kiley, like I said. Uh, currently, I'm the principal content uh, architect over at SimSpace. Uh, so I make uh, cyber ranges, I make content, I make uh, training modules for the kind of global Fortune 100, uh, big banks, big organizations, the government, that kind of stuff. Um, I do like red team. I, I really, I specialize in kind of red team training. So I'm, I'm kind of more of a, a dyed in the wool red teamer, um, kind of exploit developer, that kind of stuff. But I also have uh, an interest in malware analysis uh, to kind of round out a skill set. Um, and so other kind of just little facts about me, uh, I'm a mountaineer. I've uh, hiked Mount Kilimanjaro, which you can see right there. Um, I've hiked a lot of the New Hampshire White Mountain Ranges. Uh, I was on the Appalachian Trail and I had to turn back because of the COVID-19 outbreak. That's a whole story I'll, I'll tell you sometime. Um, but other places and things that I've, I've done, I'm a Marine Corps veteran. Uh, I was in the air wing of the Marine Corps as an intel analyst and a uh, special access program security officer. I worked at uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology Lincoln Laboratory in their space research division as their lead cybersecurity analyst. Um, and you can see some of my my uh, credentials and you know certs and, and that kind of stuff. And uh, on Twitter, I'm husky ha at husky hacks mk. Uh, so send me memes. Send me lots of memes. Uh, brief. History of NIM. NIM is not a new programming language. It's been around for a decent amount of time now. Um, the genesis of NIM, it goes back to about 2006, maybe 2005, by a gentleman by the name of Andreas Rumpf, uh, who put together a, uh, a language that he called NIMROD. And so during its initial release, it was built in Pascal originally, and then a self-bootstrapped version of the NIM compiler was written and released for the public in about 2008. So NIM has actually been around for a while. Um, and, and this is a, this, a bit of a meme in the community right now. Um, I say this with absolute, uh, you know, compassion and love in my heart for the NIM devs. Um, but, uh, someone asked on their forums at one point, can you help me, uh, create a function pointer in NIM and pass an argument, uh, to execute shellcode? And one of the lead developers, uh, Iraq, um, said, please don't write malware in NIM. Um, so that, you know, that is just a bit of, bit of a meme. Um. But so, like I said, NIM's not new. It's it's an older language. It's statically typed and cross com uh, it cross platform. You have cross compilation capability. It's a compiled language. Um, so what you're going to find is that it kind of has the DNA of things like Haskell, functional programming, object oriented languages. Uh, NIM's um, approach is that uh, object oriented is like a way to solve problems, but it's not really the way to solve every problem. So it um, it can be uh, run basically like a script, like you're gonna see it here in a second that it can almost be run like a Python script uh, as a compiled language, but has the capability to be object oriented. Um, it is uh, statically typed uh, and it is, I like to say that it's kind of like this, this 
dance. Um, if you ever watch Dragon Ball Z when they do the fusion dance, like fusion, ha! Uh, it's the it's like Python and C plus plus did the fusion dance, and 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 Nim was the result of that. So Nim is a Super Saiyan, essentially, is what I'm saying. Uh, so if you want to install Nim, it's incredibly easy with the Choose Nim package, which is more or less the official way to install it. If you want to follow along with like everything that I do tonight. Um, you would want to, one, set up like a Flare VM workstation, which would be this over here. But two, you would actually want to install the NIM compiler. And uh, I've, I've provided some source code in there for you. Oops, don't want to do that. Um, I provided some source code in here for you, and you can go ahead and download the compiler and then just start running with it. Uh, so why NIM? Why NIM indeed? A uh, couple of very interesting things about the language that I like a lot. Um, the syntax of Nim, like I said, it's like if Python and C++ uh, did the fusion dance. The syntax of Nim is like the most straightforward, with the exception of Python itself, it's the most straightforward programming slash interpreted language, or compiled slash interpreted language that I've ever seen. And like, look no further than Hello World, which is straight up echo Hello World. You can compile that into an executable and you can execute that and you get a string back echoed to you. Uh, it doesn't get more simple than that. Um, let's take a look at a simple little echo server here. So uh, block comment right up here, you import net, um, and then you go to town uh, defining your variables, and then you write like 10, 20 more lines of code, and you have an echo server. Um, I want to take a pause here. If anybody else has written, if you think back to maybe some of the other times that you've written different programs in different programming languages, especially the kind of lower level ones, the ones that are um, uh, memory, you, you need to allocate in free memory. Uh, there's a lot of things, a lot, a lot of things abstracted away from you and Nim that are not, that you don't have to worry about. Um, Save for the fact that I've imported net and just like made a socket. If you've ever tried to do that in something like um, uh, C++ or Rust even, it's a little more involved than what you see right here, but this is super straightforward, super clean. Um, so how would you, with given this, this code right here, how would you actually compile this? This is another one of NIM's very interesting benefits. Cross compilation capability in the age of languages that all have this, Go, Rust has this, you know, they all have this. Um, what makes this special? Well, NIM can compile the same exact code into different architectures and different operating systems. And all you need, and here's the kicker, all you need to do this you can use it to, to if, you, if you install it on Linux, you can use the, the uh, GCC compiler, the, which I guess is redundant, but you can use GCC natively. NIM is basically like a wrapper around that compiler, and it, it says, I'm going to handle a lot of the stuff that you um, would normally need to do in a language that you're compiling. Um, so just let me do that. If you install NIM on Linux, it's going to be able to compile into Linux ELF files like right out the box. And then... The other kicker here is that it also can compile cross cross compile into Windows executable uh, portable executable format and DLLs, and it can compile into like JavaScript, and it can compile into there are there are ways to compile programs for the Nintendo Switch on NIM. So like that kind of goes to show you how powerful this language is. the The thing that you need to compile to Windows, and and it's pertinent to this talk because malware for Windows is is kind of the centerpiece here. You need the minimum uh, GNU compiler for Windows, MingW. So installing the tool chain for MingW gets you access to i386 architecture, uh, AMD64 architecture. You can compile this into x x86 and x64 portable executables on Windows. And another one of the kickers here is that these binaries, when you... Well, uh, even before I say that, think to like Go and Rust. How big, when you compile those programs into Windows uh, portable executables, how big are those programs? They're enormous. NIM compiles down to less than a megabyte in most cases with options in the compiler fly to go even lower. So if you're talking about, and this is a spoiler for later in the talk, but if you're talking about small portable executable programs that get in there, get your malware on target, and then disappear, and I mean that literally, uh, <laughs> as you'll see later, um, it almost doesn't get better than NIM. Um, so why don't we just demo the Echo Server here? So I'll go ahead and launch Echo Server, and I'll go over to, I think I had one open. Yep, I had my Python interpreter. Um, so let's netcat uh, nv127001. And you got to go on port 1738. There you go. Echo Server. Awesome. And you can actually see in the, in the notebook over here. You can, yeah. 
hello world. Great. So that was the code that you just saw up here. We compiled, we ran it. Uh, in the repo for this talk, um, if you go down to the samples directory and you go find the socket sample, there is one for Linux that we just ran right here, and then there's one for Windows as well, the .exe. Um, so that's a little bit of the kind of history and kind of the, the background and why NIM um, and why might we want to uh, use NIM for offensive and offensive purposes and, and try to understand its, uh, its kind of defensive uh, architecture as well. Uh, at this point, do I have any questions? Uh, does anybody have anything that they'd like further explained? Trying to watch my, my time splits here just to make sure I have enough time. Um, all right, we're going to keep it rolling. Let's go right to the malware analysis section. This, this is a little involved, um, but this is one of my favorite parts. Uh, so let's get it. All right, so NIM from a malware analysis perspective. NIM binaries, like I said, are, are um, they're small, they're, they're lethal. Um, how do we analyze them? How do we approach them from kind of like a malware analysis perspective? Um, what I wanted to do for this one is focus in on one specific uh, aspect of, of NIM compiled binaries when we talk about binary and malware analysis. And there are many, I had to basically choose my favorite one because there are so many things that we could talk about right now in, in terms of like how to actually analyze NIM malware and what makes them different from say something compiled in C++. And so what I wanted to do is focus on this right here, which is that all NIM Windows binaries, all NIM Windows binaries dynamically resolve their API calls. So let's talk about a little bit of what this means. I, I don't know the technical background of everybody in on, on the call here, so I'd like to just elaborate a little further on what I mean by that, just because to account for maybe differences in, in expertise. So um, a Windows binary, a Windows executable program, in most cases, when you want to run it, when you when you bring it right over here to Flare VM and you want to run cpp shell exec.exe, uh, it will load the, the operating system will hand control of the execution over to that program. That program will do whatever it was designed to do, and then it will bring you back out and uh, hand control back over to the operating system. Now, when it is performing the things inside of that program, a lot of the time, way back in the day, when people realized that, hey, we want to make programs easier to write for people, let's build a bunch of pre canned, prefabricated functions that we can give and we can put them in dynamic linked libraries that are all around the Windows operating system. And so we're going to give you a blueprint to run any kind of function from this list that you want to run as long as you just pass in the parameters correctly, you define it correctly, you tell us where to go, and we're going to let you, we're going to give you kind of like an easier way to run this. That is the Windows API, the application programming interface. It is this series of functions that are in the DLLs around the Windows operating system that if you want to shell execute something, you can go find the shell execute function inside of this DLL, shell32.dll, and you can pass it some parameters and it will do the heavy lifting for you. So in most Windows programs, the way that that happens is through this thing called the import address table. In fact, I, I, I'll, I'll get it up later uh, to show you, but you're actually kind of looking at it right now. The import address table is like a phone book for Windows API calls. A binary lands on the operating system. The operating system gives control to the binary. And while it is executing the program, before it actually gets to any of the functions, it says, ah, I see from this entry in the import address table that this program wants to use one of the APIs that are in this DLL. I am going to load in that DLL for them and, and, and I'm going to set up that function so that they can use it. The compiler is going to recognize how that needs to take place, the parameters that need to be passed in to do that. Um, and then during execution, the method, the way, the blueprint of that API call is already set up, right? So NIM binaries do not do that. And let's take a, let's do a little experiment here to prove that. Um, when you cat out the contents of CPP, C++, shell exec dot CPP, we have a very, very simple 
uh, Windows executable program here. All it does is it will pass in the parameters to the shell execute API, which is located in shell32.dll, and it will say, hey, all you need to do is open Notepad. That's it. And then some other parameters that are not really important for this. So the IAT, when this program gets compiled, that shell execute W in this case, um, I can talk about the difference between the, the final character if, if anybody's interested, but shell execute get, gets registered in the import address table. And it says, ah, they want to use shell execute uh, W. We're going to go find shell 32 DLL. And when this program is run, we're going to invoke it from that DLL and they're going to be able to pull off opening notepad. Simple, right? Um, so let's look at this program that I uh, collaborated with a few other analysts in the field with. It's called malapireader.py. It's a very simple Python script that will uh, scrape these API calls out of a compiled portable executable, and it will pass them to this website right here. It's called malapi.io. And each of these API calls are commonly, and Mr. Docs, by the way, so this, this is like, I, let me back up. I, I got to give credit where credit's due. Uh, this is a collaboration between uh, myself, Squibbly-Doo, and Mr. Docs. Uh, Mr. Docs put together the malapi.io here, and Squibbly-Doo put together uh, most of the code um, from the, at the outset of the project. Uh, so what this program is doing, this Python script, is it's checking these API calls against all of these that are commonly known uh, to be malicious. So shell execute. So shell execute A. And we'll go in here and we'll say, okay, what is shell execute A usually used for? It's used to perform an operation on a specific file. In uh, malapi.io, Mr. Docs has put together malware samples that use this. Uh, the documentation, just the MSDN, so you can go in here and see like how, how to actually call this function. Um, but all things considered, malapi reader is scraping these um, APIs out of the portable executable and checking them against malapi.io and saying, hey, do we have any hits? Well, we do, in fact. Shell execute A, this very uh, API call that we have up here. Again, oh, don't worry that there's an A at the end of it. That's, that's, uh, I'll, I'll, I can cover that later. Um, shell execute A is identified as a malicious API call. And it'll give you a little bit of a kind of information about this. So um, if we then take the memory or really the hex address inside of this compiled executable and go over to flare vm we can actually rip this thing open and we're going to use a program called cutter which is kind of like gidra if you're familiar with gidra actually i already have it right here um and we'll open this up with cutter and this is an advanced uh static analysis that we're kind of in the advanced static analysis phase um but remember this is just a c plus plus program very simple very clean and so what we're going to do is go see if we can find, just clean this up a little bit. We'll see if we can go find where the API is located in here. And in any case, we find the call to the actual uh, D word value of shell execute W. So great. So we've got a reference value right here. Let's go open up the main function, the function from which all other functions are called. And I'll actually put it into graph because this is like very, very simple to, to kind of um, analyze here we see that our shell execute w function is passed in right here. So call d word shell execute w, all of the parameters that are used in this function call are right here. Notepad, open. You don't even really need to worry about what the rest of this is doing, but we see notepad is in there. We see open is in there. If we remember the source code of this, which was up a little ways, open and notepad right there. All right, so we, we now have a bead on where our program is in the execution of this. It's right in the main function. It is defined in the import address table. And when the operating system hands control over to the uh, portable executable, this is where it takes place. They call, and um, just as kind of a side note, the calling convention here, uh, the, um, the, the parameters for this API call are being passed in right to left, I believe. So the last one is right here, the second to last one right here, the third to last one. Um, so in, in other words, it goes before the call, first param, second param, third param, fourth param, and so on and so forth. So that is uh, a C++ executable. That's a, a bit of a crash course in doing a C++ ex executable. We double click on it, notepad spawns, the world moves on. So NIM doesn't do that. NIM plays by its own rules, in fact. Um, 
So let's take a look at the source code for the same exact thing, but in Nim, the implementation in Nim. We are making use of the win Nim library. The win Nim library, another kind of incredible piece of work for the Nim programming language, is a series of custom or really pre-built uh, API call templates, right? So instead of bootstrapping your way over to the Windows API, you now have the ability to call the Windows API directly by defining it just like you would in any other program. So we have a let shell exec equals shell execute. We're calling the API right here, and we just have to pass in the parameters. First parameter is zero. I forget which one that is, but we could just check the documentation. That's the hand, okay, the handles of the program, so we're, we're not uh, doing anything with that. Open notepad, exact same code as what we saw right up here. Open notepad. So let's go ahead and run mal API reader again against the nim shell exec.exe, the compiled nim program that does the exact same thing that I just showed you for the C uh, binary. And it just needs to think for a second. It's kind of, you know, scraping, scraping. And here we go. We have some hits. We even have a couple hits that weren't in the C binary, but is there any noticeable omission at this point? I'll give you a second to look over it. If you were thinking, that shell execute is not in the identified API calls, you'd be correct. The shell execute API call, which we found right here in the C++ binary, which is right here, identified as a malicious API call, is not, is not in the compiled NIM shell execution program. They do the exact same thing, but this one does not have that API call listed in the import address table. So, Let's go track it down in Flare. So we'll take shell exec.exe and we'll take cutter again. And I will um, I'll just do a new new window here. Nim shell exec.exe. Let's go into this and see what we have to work with. All right. So nothing really looks out of place. Just a bunch of assembly. I hate assembly. It's always so hard to read. But let's go to the main function. Let's just find what's in the main function because the Main function is where every other API call should be, and it should be in here somewhere. And, huh, that's weird. Okay, I see like underscore underscore main and just a whole bunch of like weird stuff and then like underscore nim main. Okay, that's interesting. So, um, all right, let's just go into nim main. All right, great. In nim main, sure, maybe the, all the API calls are in here. Let's see where they're hiding. Okay, again, really weird. I've got like pre main, I've got like init stack bottom with. Like, what is going on here? What is nim main inner? What, let's go into pre main. I don't know. And here, Three, three, count them, three function calls in from the very, very front of the program, the main function. We start to unravel what NIM is doing with the win NIM library and why this could be so confusing for a defense team. Because we are not defining our functions and our API calls in the import address table. We are making use of a couple of different like wrapping conventions but that's not even really the important part. The important part is that win nim underscore shell API date in it right here is a function call in and of itself. All right, so let's go in here. What do we have here? Well, we have two functions that are the the pinnacle of why the like like the thesis statement for why nim binaries are so sneaky because they resolve all of their function calls dynamically at runtime. When the operating system hands control over to the portable executable, a NIM compiled portable executable, before you even get into the main part of the what the program is doing, before we even get into that shell execute function, we've got two API calls that are dead giveaways. NIM load library and NIM get proc address. And these are both wrappers over the true blue load library and get proc address API calls. So let's roll it back a little bit. What do these calls do? In a normal program, API calls for NIM, for excuse me, for load library and get proc address are going to resolve any DLLs and API calls inside of those DLLs that the, the program does not know where they are immediately. So if they're not in the import address table, get proc address and load library will step in and say, okay, we've got to go find shell execute. So what uh, DLL is shell execute normally located in? Oh, shell32.dll. Okay, let's load. Whoops, I hit the wrong thing. Let's load that library. Oh man, look at this. So then we load the library. 
we step back out of that function, we compare a couple values into uh, EAX uh, just to make sure that the library was loaded. Usually it will return a value if the library was not loaded correctly. And that's this kind of jump if not equal to right here. Um, and then there's an error if, in, in that case, but then we get to get proc address. Okay, now that we have the DLL in question here, which is this value right here, um, let me copy that. And if you hit X, uh, you're going to be able to X reference, um, cross reference anywhere uh, that the highlighted value is in the rest of the program. And you can see that this shell 32 value is kind of built on the fly here and passed in as the uh, parameter for load library. So it says, okay, go find me shell 32. All right, we've got shell 32. Now take the string shell execute W and pass that in to get proc address. And so when we use the value of shell execute W and pass it in to get proc address. Get proc address is going to say inside shell 32, where do I need to go? What is the address of this API call that they're trying to use? And it will return that into the value of EAX and then it will get back out of the this function. And now we have the capability to actually call shell execute W. Let's take a pause here because how many layers of the onion did we have to unravel in order to do that, we stepped into the main function, that's one. We stepped into nim main, that's two. We stepped into nim main inner, that's three. We stepped into win nim, get process, uh, get proc address and load library, that's four and five respectively. And then eventually we got a string that's passed into the parameter to call the actual API call. That's like seven different layers of, 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 of insanity inside of this portable executable that we need to identify to find that it's malicious. And so, when we double click on this, the exact same thing ha happens. It just spawns notepad.exe. But what if that was like download and execute a cobalt strike beacon, right? This is like one of the, and, and, and the implications of this, how far the rabbit hole goes with like how resilient this would be to like antivirus and EDR, I am not totally sure of at this point. I'm, I'm still doing research about that. But I think my, my, my inkling is that NIM binaries do well against antivirus and EDR simply because they have so many complexities about their normal operating conventions and procedures when it comes to things like API calls. So... That is one of the most interesting things that I've seen about this whole ordeal is that it kind of flips the static, the static identification of malicious binaries on its head because you could stuff any malicious function that uses API calls to download and execute things or, or open a process to L, uh, uh, open a handle to LSAS or do any kind of malicious functionality. But if the APIs are not in the import address table, that takes a whole section and it's not everything. It's not impossible. Um, but that takes a whole section, a big chunk out of what, how you would normally find uh, a malicious executable. And so that that's imp it's important to note that that doesn't mean that these things are invisible to EDRs. Um, for anyone who knows a little bit about how EDRs kind of function, what, what Falcon, what CrowdStrike Falcon will do is it will sync its f little Falcon hooks uh, into your portable executable via, via a DLL that it loads in remotely. And so every API call that is like sus, right, it will load in that DLL in and, and basically put a little instruction right before that DLL or, or right before that uh, API call and say, hey, before you do this API call, just bring it over here, bring it into CrowdStrike Falcon. We're going to look at it. We're going to make sure that it's not malicious. That's known as hooking, right? When, when people call, uh, when people talk about unhooking or hooking, that's what they're talking about. They say, there's a DLL that's been loaded into my process that puts instructions right before all of my calls. And if uh, it redirects the kind of flow of the program into uh, the, the EDR and inspects what I'm doing first. So that, that's just kind of a little side note about what unhooking uh, is. Um, so, that doesn't remove the EDR hooks. Just because they're not in the import address table does not mean that at runtime in the dynamic environment, the portable executable does does not have EDR hooks in it. It may very well still have them. I don't have access to a lab with CrowdStrike anymore. I, I used to, um, and, and back when I did, maybe I, I could have gotten the answer to that, but I, I, I don't have access to that anymore. So that's kind of like a, a follow-on thing that needs to be researched. Um, and yeah, and then we just see the NIM uh, binaries import address table. And again, there are some things that might be suspicious here, but a lot of them are really just going to boil down to get proc address and load library A. And between those two API calls, every other API that you want to use as a malicious actor will be resolved at runtime. 
And that's just proof that um, shell 32 DLL isn't even in the imported table right here. So it's not even on the on the map as far as, uh, you know, inspecting what, what DLLs are being used for this. Um, before I move on to the last little, little part of this, uh, are there any questions at this point? All right, awesome. This is just a little note about how I think NIM malware analysis is starting to gain traction um, as the kind of community, as the, the researcher, the security researcher community comes alive around it. Um, it looks like NIM binaries are starting to get signatured. They're starting to have, um, you know, dynamic signatures written for them. Uh, this is from Thor. I found this on one of the, of the PMAT um, challenge binaries. So the practical malware analysis and triage. Uh, one of the challenge binaries I wrote for that course, I threw it into Virus Total, and looky look, Nextron Systems uh, uh, project called Thor, uh, which kind of like just like scans binaries and, and looks for malicious uh, patterns in them, uh, came up with a, a positive match, uh, so that that it, it identified this as a sus uh, nim binary. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, let's move on to offensive nim. So we've talked a little bit about malware analysis. Let's talk about the other side of the coin. Um, so why why NIM for offensive purposes? Um, I've hit a little bit of this from the beginning of this program, but uh, let's just reiterate here. I mean, like you've already seen that the Windows API can be called directly with the use of the WinNIM library. Like that's huge. That's like elegant access to the Windows API without needing to like manage a whole bunch of, um, you know, extraneous uh, parameters and, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. That's that's like huge, right? Um, so compiled binaries, they, they compile, this is, this is actually, I, I skipped this at the beginning, but this is huge. Compiled NIM binaries compile right down to native operating system code. Excuse me. Um, what that means is that you don't have to run in an interpreter like Python or a, a virtual machine like Java or, um, any other kind of runtime. You, you're not even running in the .NET framework if you don't want to, the hint, hint, um, you don't need to run in any other kind of environment. So you're running on the metal of the operating system when you write NIM binaries. That's huge, huge, because that reduces your overhead of, of execution. That reduces your portable executable size. Uh, that means your code rips like real fast. Um, they're uh, much, much smaller than Go and Rust. Like by, by orders of magnitude, they're much smaller than Go and Rust. Uh, maybe not faster than Rust, but they're definitely smaller. Uh, you can call the component object model uh, directly with NIM, which is very, very powerful for post-exploitation um, capabilities. Uh, you can also generate Windows uh, DLLs, like I said earlier. Um, and so no talk about the offensive uh, applications of NIM would be complete without shouting out what I like to call, refer to as the sacred text, which is the offensive NIM repo, which is by uh, Marcello Salvati. And so the, I have this like on speed dial. So th this is, if you're, if you have, if you take one thing, one thing away from this talk and you're, you have a little bit of an interest in the maldev applications of NIM or, or just NIM in general. And I, I think the NIM devs would kill me for saying this, but if you have interest in NIM at all, um, this is where you want to go. And it's just so, it, it is chock full to the brim of proof of concepts for every possible little malicious activity that you'd ever want to do. Um, you've got everything in here. I call out a couple in, in, um, in the, in the text of the Jupyter notebook, but like you're, you've got like LSAS dumping, you've got encryption and decryption, you've got self-deleting, which I mentioned earlier. Um, you've got, uh, execute uh, shellcode, shell code, like, uh, create remote thread style shell code execution. You've got just like you, there's stuff in here that I've read, I've read through the code and it just, it, I don't even understand what's going on, but it's so cool. Key loggers. Uh, you can bootstrap the Python interpreter right in NIM. You can bootstrap the uh, uh, common language runtime. You can access the common language runtime, unmanaged PowerShell. The, like the, the Marcello and, and company, because there are tons of contributors to this one, his proof of concepts for this are just like, they're, they're off the chain. Um, so keep this, keep this on speed dial if you're interested. Um, and basically, I want to say that like I'm standing on the shoulders of the giants here because every little trick that I learned how to do in NIM came from that repo. Um, so Marcello, if you're listening to this, uh, just thank you. Thank you for your work. You've done incredible stuff. And everybody who contributed to that, uh, thank you for your work. I, I learned from that basically every time that I look at it, I learned something new. Um, so let's talk, let's look at some code for some NIM malware, shall we? Actually, I'm going to open this. I think it'd be a little easier on the eyes. 
yeah, there it is. I'm going to open this in Visual Studio Code. So let, let's step through like what what NIM can bring to the table in terms of like malicious uh, uh, functionality. So we're rolling with uh, Marcello's, uh, really my slight altered variation of Marcello's create remote thread uh, shell code injector. So for those not familiar, um, this is a way to take a block of shell code. So I just made it with MSF Venom and it just spawns calc.exe. Uh, you can take a block of shell code, which is just basically think of shell code as like position independent code that you can run just based on the instructions that are here. So it doesn't need anything else uh, to be able to actually run this, uh, whatever is happening in here, which in this case is just calc.exe. Um, th this method is a way to open up a remote process and inject this shellcode right into it and then start a thread in that process to run whatever is happening right here. This technique used to be very, very stealthy. It is not so much anymore now that defenders have caught on to it, but it's still a really good... I, I In a blog post I wrote for this, I call it scrambled eggs. It's it's You're making scrambled eggs for the kitchen uh, the your first day on staff at a, at a big restaurant, right? They want to know, can you make scrambled eggs? Can you do the simple stuff? This would be like a simple malware development scrambled eggs kind of thing. So in NIM, uh, functions are known as procs or procedures. Uh, you've got typing on your array that you pass in. So we have our shellcode block right up here, which is just calc.exe, remember? Um, so we say that it's an array of bytes. Uh, and then what we're going to do is we start up a process, which in this case is going to be notepad.exe, and we immediately put it into a suspended state. So you start notepad, but before it even launches, you hold the process in suspense. And then, like I said, easy access to the Windows APIs. We're going to use a very classic, clean implementation of the create remote thread series of API calls. The first thing that we do, the very, very first thing that we do is we grab the handle to that process that we just opened up with the open process uh, API call. And we take the handle to that and we say, we now have access to this process that we just started. The next thing we do is we allocate a section of virtual memory inside of that process that we're going to write our shell code into. We're not writing it yet, but we are opening a, a, a length of shellcode in the running memory of that process, the length of which is the block of shellcode in size. And we're opening it with a very special set of permissions. Page, execute, read, write. On a scale of like, you know, when we talk about is that suspicious, like on a scale of like... Um, you know, I saw you in Medbay to like, I just saw you vent. Like this is not, this is a little suspicious. This is not that bad though. But often if you do this technique, this is going to be the only thing in that process that has execute, read, write, full access to that section of memory. So be aware, if, uh, if, you're, a, if you're a red teamer, be aware that there are implications to doing it this way. Um, but this is probably the most simple way to do what we're trying to do. So just, just be aware. Um, what you then do is actually write, now that you have kind of the, 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 the fence up around that section of, of memory, you're going to actually write in the shellcode bytes uh, to that section of memory. And so what have we done so far? Remember, we opened up our process. With that handle to the process, we said, make me a size of memory that is just big enough to put the shellcode into, and then we're actually going to write that there. Again, suspicion-wise, like we're, we're you know flirting with danger here, but then we get to this one. Uh, create remote thread. And I like to say that create remote thread is like, uh, if it is statically defined in the import address table of your malicious binary, this is like trying to get through a metal detector with a bazooka in your trench coat. It's a bad idea to leave this in the import address table. Um, because I, I'm not like a systems programmer. I don't know like all of the uses of this API call, but this is like the most um, abused and dangerous uh, API call that exists in in the in the the Windows operating system, and so what ends up happening is that you go to that process and you say, "Hey, remember the address that you wrote that shellcode in? Can you just go ahead and start a thread on that? Just just a thread, no nothing, no big deal." And then the operating system will look at the area of memory and go, "Ah, they want me to run these hex bytes. All right, here we go." And then it will spawn calc.exe or spawn a cobalt strike beacon or, you know, download and execute something. So that is your classic memory 
thread injection pattern for uh, create remote thread, and that is its implementation in NIM. We are a hundred lines of code, and that's with spaces and extra things that I probably wouldn't leave echo statements that I would not leave in the actual proof of concept. That's with shell code that's actually in in board here in line. Um, you know, not grabbing it from somewhere else. So in, I'd say, I'd estimate maybe 60 lines of code. You have a full, if you weaponize it and and uh, kind of remove all the extra stuff, you have a full create remote thread injector written in NIM that compiles down to maybe, I don't know, it's 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 maybe a couple megs, if that, probably not even. Um, so stuff's dangerous. Like it's 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 really elegant, it's really simple, and the things you can do with it as proven by Marcello's offensive NIM repo are just, they're, they're absolutely, there's no limit. Your, your, your knowledge base and creativity as a red teamer is the only limit to like what you can do with this stuff. Um, so that was the first uh, proof of concept that I wanted to show tonight. Um, at this point, are there any questions? All right. Last up in the offensive category, I actually might uh, have to skip over this. I don't know how long eh, we've got. Yeah, you know what? I'll, I'll go over this. Um, so what I wanted to show off tonight uh, and give you all a little peek behind the curtain of the, the PMAT development um, that I've been doing. So I, I've been updating the course kind of over time, but uh, there is uh, a new binary that I'm going to add to the course. Um, and you guys are seeing it for the first time tonight. You're actually seeing the source. So it's a DNS Xfil Cosmo. Um, some of you may know Cosmo is my cat. Uh, I key my malware that I write for PMAT off of his picture as long as it's on the desktop of Flare VM. So if you're doing the PMAT course to hedge against my malware being used actually for malicious purposes, I keep a picture of my cat on uh, the desktop of the Flare VM uh, box and all of the malware, most of it anyway, uh, looks for that on the desktop, and if it's there, it executes, and if it's not, it doesn't. Um, so what you uh, are looking at right now is a binary that will read in the bytes of that file and encode them in URL safe base 64, and then blast those off via DNS exfiltration. So DNS exfiltration is a method of tunneling uh, information or maybe stolen data out of an environment uh, by bouncing it off of a DNS server via text record lookups. So the idea is that um, you're going to take your data. In this instance, you can use this for a couple different reasons. Um, but in this instance, you're going to take the data, you're going to crunch it into a subdomain. Uh, you can kind of see it right there. So basically what ends up happening is that this calls NSLOOKUP uh, to query dot domain name. And so query is all of the encoded bytes of this uh, file and domain name is a predetermined uh, uh, variable that you can set as a uh, domain. And so I kind of took uh, inspiration from Nishang that has a do exfiltration.ps1 and I implemented it in NIM. Um, this also has a special feature. In fact, let's just roll right over to the lab to show. Um, let me make sure my... Um, we'll do the HTTP server right there. We'll do the DNS server right there. And let's roll out with DNS XFIL Cosmo. Uh, again, this is a prototype, so it's not fully weaponized, and that's why you see kind of the, the console out right here. But we got some lub dubs. Look at these lub dubs. These are great, great lub dubs. Um, what the lub dubs are doing is this has kind of a heartbeat. And so um, this is like a what would be known as like a dead man switch where the lub dubs are going and at a predetermined interval, in, interval DNS Xfil Cosmo is going out to uh, HTTP colon slash slash hey dot you up dot local. Um, and every second or three seconds or something like that, it pings, hey, you up, hey, you up, hey, you up. If it gets a 200 okay response, it just goes right back into that loop. Um, and it continues. However, if, and I, I've, I've uh, set my Kali box in range to be the IP address of heyuup.local. However, if I were to kill the uh, Python HTTP server and that binary does not get a 200 okay from heyuup.local, uh, in a couple seconds over here, it's thinking, it's thinking, it's thinking, and then it should go... Oh, my terminal was hung. There we go. Um, it's thinking, and then as soon as it realizes that this is not uh, uh, a 200 response anymore, it blasts out 
all of this encoded data as the subdomains of cosmos for boots emporium dot local. And so you see from the DNS, I've bound this server, this simple little Python server to my, my DNS uh, on, on UDP on port 53. And so it has crunched all of the data of the cosmo.jpg file. So this guy right here, look at him. Um, it's crunched that into it's URL safe base 64 added those in a sequence, and then one by one it trickles out and, and exfiltrates all of that data out as text record lookups to Cosmos for boots emporium.local. So that is a NIM example of a DNS exfiltration. Did someone have a... Did someone have a question? All right. Um, so, and I kind of explained that. Um, yeah, let's talk. I think for the last eight. Oh man, we're right on time. This is perfect. Uh, last eight minutes of this. There, there's no um, uh, interactive part of this one. This is just called the night that Taggart and I reverse nimble.exe. Uh, if you don't know who Taggart is, MT Taggart, um, also known as Taggart Tech on uh, YouTube, look him up. He is like one of the the best examples of someone who is technically proficient and also really good at like teaching and explaining things. Um, I'm proud to call him a friend. He's taught me so many different things and we're actually working on a little project right now that's not quite ready to see the light of day, but um, you'll know when it when it drops. But basically Taggart and I, uh, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's, uh, let's start here. Um, so on the night of January 5th of, of this year, 2020, um, the patron saint of reverse engineering, John Hammond, tweets the following, and he says, you sneaky mom. And if you look closely, you'll see that he's downloading on Windows, he's downloading the NIM installation client for 1.6.2. I know that's a little hard to, to see, but you just take my word for it. He's downloading NIM 1.6.2, and it says couldn't download virus detected. Interesting. So, John inadvertently stumbled upon something that Taggart and I had researched uh, in October of 2021. So, just a couple months prior, um, he found, and we found back in the day, that certain installation clients for the NIM language, so if you're getting it from NIM uh, from the NIM official website and you download it on your Windows host, some of them trigger Defender. So we were like, okay, why is this happening? I actually had found this out earlier, but I didn't really think too much about it because I published a blog post like back in summer of 2021 and somebody made a comment on that blog post that said, hey, I wanted to follow along with this. And that's what I'm reading right here. I wanted to follow along with this, but uh, Windows Defender triggered and said that there was uh, a virus in here. And they said they go on to say that maybe a false positive, but the whole post is about exploits, so I'll probably not risk it. And I, I, I respond and I said I don't blame you for thinking that. Um, I wasn't actually aware because I always install my NIM stuff on Linux that uh, there would be any kind of defender trigger on this. Um, so I didn't really think too much of it. But eventually, as kind of NIM got a little more popular in the in kind of the circles that that I was hanging out with, um, the question came up again. And I started thinking about like, okay, if if this person, rightly so, missed downloading NIM and, and coding in the language because they were afraid that there was a virus in there, well, I don't blame them for that at all. But think about the devs of NIM at that point. And think about how they would respond. If you have, go to the NIM GitHub page, there are 20,000 commits to that code base. And how would you feel as a developer of a language if you've done some amount of that 20,000 commit work and your installation client for your language is triggering on Defender and that's making people say, nope, not, not, not doing it. So um, on the night of October 26th on Taggart's stream that he does, he does it every um, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Saturday, I believe, uh, he said, we're going to look at the binary on stream and we're going to reverse it, and we're going to find out why it's triggering Defender. So I tweeted at the NIM devs, and I said, I'm not going to stop writing malware and NIM, but I will use my skills as a red teamer to identify why your NIM binaries are uh, triggering malware, or triggering Defender. Um, and I was hoping that I'd be like, uh, you know, there's maybe a little bit of a rift in the community at that point between the NIM devs and the, and the kind of red teamer community, but I was like, maybe we can extend the olive branch here, maybe we can figure out why this is happening, and and and, you know, everybody will be better for it. And so on Taggart Stream, we set up the experiments. We were going to identify which binaries were actually triggering 
and look into them with malware reverse engineering uh, methodology and a little bit of like red team weaponeering methodology too to figure out why this was happening. And so the subject that we went with was the nimble.exe binary for 1.4.8 in the x64 architecture. If you go to the NIM website right now and try to download that, I think it will still trigger Windows Defender. So I talk a little bit about the methodology that we used here. Um, you can watch the full stream. I've linked it right there. Uh, it's Nim versus Defender with Husky Hacks, but that was uh, Tiger and I did that. Um, it's 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 like pretty long. I mean, all of, all of the streams are, but like that one was pretty long. And by the end of it, I was getting like absolutely punchy and I couldn't even put sentences together uh, because of what, what I was doing. But basically the way it ended up happening was, um, I'll just summarize it here. I was, a, I was rolling out the nimble.exe executable uh, Nimble, by the way, is like a package manager for Nim. I, I don't think I mentioned that. Um, it's basically like if you want to install another package from GitHub, uh, you'll do Nimble install, you know, arg parse or Nimble install something like that. Um, so it's it's the it's the package manager. It's not the main Nim compiler, but it's the, like the package. It's like pip, right, for for Python. Um, so what ends up happening is that I I, inst I I bring the binary out to the desktop. I shut before I do that. I shut Windows Defender off. I attach a debugger, uh, x64 dbg, I attach that to Nimble, I turn Windows Defender back on, and then run through each of the uh, instructions in that binary until I identify which one is actually triggering when the instruction executes, which one is triggering uh, Windows Defender. And that was a huge, huge process of trial and error, because if you know anything about a, deb a debugger, maybe I could show you right now, in fact. Oh, God. Hi, Cosmo. Um... <laughs> x64 uh, debug. If you know anything about a debugger, I apologize for the use of light mode here, by the way. Um, yeah, sure. We're, we're fault.exe. Um, oh, that's a x32, x86. I can't do that. Uh, we'll open up, um, see if uh, DNSX full Cosmo. Okay. If you know anything about a debugger, what I'm doing when I hit F8 through the debugger is I'm executing each of these instructions. I'm either stepping over or stepping into the, the instructions here. And so in a debugger, it's a one-way street. You can go forward. You can go forward as many instructions as you want, and you can stop whenever you want, but you cannot go back. I can't go back to that call that I just went over, right? The only way to do that is to either go up here and hit restart, or I have to like finish the program and reload it into the debugger and do that again. And so through a huge process of trial and error, uh, this was, and it, I didn't find it the night of, so I ended that stream still not knowing, but I tr I narrowed it down to this system call right here. And so I tweeted at the NIM devs and I said, um, I'm still doing research here, but this is what I found. This call to NTDLL, NT terminate process, when it performs this sys call right here, the program exits and Windows Defender triggers. And I didn't know and really still don't know if it exits if it triggers because of the syscall firing or if it triggers because that's the end of the program, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that this syscall is the thing that's doing it. And so why might this be the case? Well, syscalls are kind of common and, and popular among cyber criminals and red teamers for evading. Remember, we were talking about those hooks from earlier, the little falcon hooks. They're, they're good for dodging those EDR hooks. And so if you are to, my hypothesis was that if you are to exit a program with the NT terminate process as a syscall, perhaps that is flagged as malicious because of the nature of how syscalls are used to evade antivirus and EDR. That was my kind of proto, you know, result of this experiment. Um, the NIM dev seemed very appreciative. Um, I thought a little bit more about why that might be the case, and I talked it over with some of my coworkers. And one of my coworkers said, "Well, have you looked at this this paper?" And they linked me here. And this paper is called "Early Detection of Crypto Ransomware Using Pre-Encryption Detection Algorithms." Ooh. And it boils down to I, re I read through it, and basically it boils down to in addition this research had successfully identified 14 important apis that can differentiate between ransomware and goodware also known as things that aren't ransomware um these the three apis were present in most ransomware but less in goodware these apis were nt protect virtual memory nt resume thread and nt terminate process and so the sys call to nt terminate process 
was my reason to believe that it was triggering Defender. And lo and behold, I've got other research, again, correlation, not causation, but I've got other research here that, that corroborates that nt terminate process is commonly identified in ransomware. So unfortunately, that's kind of where I left it. I haven't really picked up this line of research again, um, but I would like to at some point. Um, but uh, that's the story of the night that Taggart and I reversed... Uh, Nimble.exe. And at this point, do I have any questions? All right. Um, oh, I think I got, let's see. <laughs> I, I want to, I want to shout out, uh, cause he just added me and I'm not going to, uh, Oh, I have, I have not been following ch this chat the whole time. I am so sorry, by the way. Um, I'll, I'll, if, if I missed anything, I will go back. But I want to shout out Caden because he was actually my old mentor um, while he was at the place that I'm currently at. Uh, and he showed up for this. He's Caden Monkey in chat. Um, so, hey, man. How you doing? <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, for conclusion, I mean, I just kind of want to talk about uh, just where to go from here. Um, and, and say again, thank you. Um, do I sleep? Yes, I do. I actually have a, a very good sleep schedule. I try to keep like really, really in, in line with my, my sleep schedule. Anyway, uh, further, further questions, further research. If you want to, if you need an idea of where to go from here, um, TLS callbacks, I've noticed that there are two locations in basically every compiled NIM binary that have TLS callbacks. If you're not familiar with what that is, it's a method of um, evading debuggers. It's like a debugger uh, defend, defeating mechanism because you can execute code in a TLS callback before a debugger um, uh, attaches to it, right? Um, so that's, that's the common malicious use of TLS callbacks. I don't know why they exist in here. This was in... DNSX Phil Cosmo, which is granted malicious, but this is this would be in like Hello World too, right? Um, so thread local storage callbacks. I don't know. I, I want to look in for that, but you can read a little bit more here on on the Hexrays blog uh, and here at a Sans um, uh, uh, article as well. And then yeah, the just just the, like more research into why the Nim a the Nimble API NT terminate process syscall is triggering Defender. Always more research that can be done about that. Um, there is my info. Those are my references. I want to say again, thank you so much, uh, to Corgi and, uh, Digital Bull, uh, AKA Metastable State. Thank you guys, uh, for having me here. This is, uh, so much fun. 